Okay, first, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and particularly to thank the speakers and you have to start off with a book presentation with um, a lot of thanks. Uh, the main ones are in this case in China or the original ones. It's a great privilege that the book, the great part of the book was originally published in Chinese and it reflects the discussions in Chongyang Institute where I work and the uh, at guancha.cn, which is the main Chinese web center-left website, in my opinion, the most important non-state center-left website in the world, which gets tens of millions of hits every day and carries huge debates uh, within the Chinese left. So therefore, I, one thing from the book that you should understand is it gives you a bit of a flavor of the debates which are taking place inside China because the original parts of the book were written for a Chinese audience. Secondly, I have to thank very much the staff of 1804 Books in the US who did all the editorial work. And I've got to thank Kenny Coyle personally very much for producing the um, UK edition. Without that, the, these things, the book couldn't have appeared. All right, what, what's the purpose of the book? The first purpose is to outline the sheer scale of what China's achievement is and what is its consequences for humanity and for socialists. The conclusion it will arrive at is very simple. China is today the most important question for socialists in the world. Indeed, everybody recognizes one of the most important questions in the world, but particularly for socialists, not only for China itself, but for its interconnection with other uh, countries. We got a graphic illustration of this a few days ago at the conference of the CPC and World Political Parties. Um, and which you had the leading, the speaker, the leading parties and the heads of government or state of over 20 countries speaking at that, in particular, Argent, particular countries in the global south, Argentina, Cuba, Vietnam, uh, Namibia, South Africa, just to name a few. And this is an incredible interaction, therefore, that takes place between China and particularly the global south. But also, what the question of the development of China poses at least three enormous questions. In addition to China itself, can other countries replicate China's success? We have to understand what the scale of China's success is. In 1949, China was almost the poorest country in the world. If you take the data of Angus Madison, who was the, the world's top expert on long-term economic growth, there are only 10 countries in the world which were had a lower per capita GDP than China. China, by, by its own internal standards, have reached what it calls most moderate prosperity, but let's to make international comparisons, use World Bank criteria for a high income economy. China will become a high income economy in either 2022 or more probably 2023. What that means that in only just over 70 years, in a single lifetime, China will have gone from almost the poorest country in the world to a uh, high income economy, which is not important million income, but it, all the choices in life, life expectancy, culture, education, health and everything in life. That's in a single lifetime. If the 84% of the population which lived in the developing countries could achieve that, then very many of the problems in the world would be solved. So the first question is, can is it something specific and unique only to China or can other countries replicate China's success? Secondly, what are the implications of this enormous fact for Marxist theory? And thirdly, as a second subsidiary question, why did the USSR collapse when China succeeded? In order to deal with these questions, I'd like to start by recalling a, a very famous Chinese saying, which says, seek truth from facts. It, this is very, very famous. If you go to the party school of the CPC in Yan'an, you can find it in Mao Zedong's own, uh, own handwriting. It appears in the CPC party school today, and it is in, on the campus of many Chinese universities. This reflects a simple fact. In very serious matters, you cannot cheat facts. You cannot cheat reality. There is no virtue in optimism. There is no virtue in realism. There is only uh, no virtue in, in pessimism. There is only a virtue in realism. That is the conclusion of this. And we have to remember, of course, that many of the leaders of the CPC of the first generation, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping uh, and, and others, 
were themselves military commanders. Um, you had to be realistic there because if you weren't realistic, you probably ended up dead. So that ended, that taught a great deal of realism in that, right, okay. We also have to understand the scale of the class struggle, which took place in China. Between 1839 and 1949, approximately 100 million people died as a result of foreign interventions, of civil wars created by foreign interventions, of famines created by these, uh, by, by these civil wars. This is, in sheer quantitative terms, the largest class struggle in a country, single country, which has ever taken place in human history. Of course, other countries have had proportionately equal ones, but it shows you the enormous struggle which took place to create the People's Republic of China. If we apply this model, this question of seek truth from facts, the first thing we have to do is establish what are the facts that have got to be explained and which are so enormous. The first is the question of the elimination of poverty in China. Again, if you take the World Bank definition of poverty, 853 million people have been lifted out of poverty in China. To give you an idea of what that means, that is almost twice the population of the entire European Union. It is bigger than the entire population of Latin America. This is the greatest social achievement, in my opinion, probably in the whole of human history and certainly in contemporary uh, period. Furthermore, it's three out of four people lifted out of poverty in the world. Carlos already mentioned the question about this. What is the implications of this? We have to say very fundamentally what type of social system could produce such an alleviation of poverty. If it was capitalism, as some people claim, some mostly on the right, but some on the left, you would have to draw an appropriate conclusion. Capitalism remains a progressive system capable of great social achievements uh, and uh, socialism is perhaps a bit premature. The reality, of course, is exact opposite. China itself represents 75% of the reduction in world poverty by well-being standards and socialist countries in, in Indochina represent another 3%. That means 78% of the people lifted out of World Bank to find poverty in the world were lifted out in socialist countries. Only 22% in capitalist countries, despite the fact that the capitalist countries have much bigger population than China or the other socialist countries, uh, more, more than twice, in fact. So in other words, the first conclusion we can draw from this is it's socialism that, draw, that takes people out of poverty. That's the first thing. Secondly, China has produced the uh, most rapid economic growth in the whole of world history from 1978 to 19 uh, to 2020 that's 42 years the average growth in China was 9.2 percent I find it rather funny because I sometimes read in the Financial Times when they say it's decades since the Western countries achieved such growth rates this is factual nonsense they never achieved such growth rates China is simply the fastest growth in economic in, 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 in world history. Again, what system produced this is a fundamental question. Okay. If you look at the interrelation with the global south, China finds itself now in alignment with an increase in discussion with countries such as uh, Brazil, Bolivia, Venezuela, many countries in Africa. Those are two questions of that. One is the practical interrelation between China and the countries of the global south. And the second is what can be learned from China's experience. Okay. Confronted with such enormous facts, the first attempt that is made is to attempt to deny these facts. Um, I'm going to deal with just one of them, um, again, which was mentioned previously, which is the Mao period. When I was writing the book, I wanted to study this very carefully because the issue is so serious you can't cheat on it. And I wanted to investigate two possible hypotheses. One was that the period of the planned economy in, the, in China, the Soviet plant type planned economy under Mao was more successful than it was generally thought. And the conclusions that I came to on that was, it is true that it was more successful than is portrayed, but it was not a dramatic economic success. It achieved during the periods of growth leaving aside the periods of the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, about 
it never achieved the growth rate of China after 1978. Secondly, there were two great disruptions of this, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, which the Chinese Communist Party regards as great mistakes, and all the research that I did confirmed that. But what astonished me and dumbfounded me almost was the social achievements of this period. In, during the period of Mao Zedong's period, the average life expectancy in China increased by 31 years in a 27 year period. If you wanna know why Mao Zedong has the authority that he does and love is the best way to express it, the Chinese people, contrary to all the lies which appear in the West, you have to understand in addition to the question of achieving national liberation, getting foreign armies out of China, if someone leads you to live 31 years longer than you expect, you tend to feel very well disposed towards them. And indeed, this is the undoubtedly the biggest social miracle in human history. So that's the two things I would say in the book. The, the Mao period, there is some denigration on the economic sphere in the West, but the most decisive thing, excessive one, but the most decisive thing is the gigantic social miracle and the improvement of the conditions of the Chinese people. Okay. If that's the attempts to deny this, and it's therefore very necessary to refute um, all, 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 the, all these facts. Um, a third thing which is posed is what explains all this? What is its implications for Marxist theory? It is clear that after 1978, China departed somewhat from the Soviet model, which was, let's say, established after 1929, and, and did this in a number of ways. Uh, it decollectivized agriculture, introducing the household responsibility system, and it opened up the economy to foreign trade. Uh, it, what it didn't do was it did not, it didn't uh, privatize the decisive sector of the economy. It is still the case that 40% of the investment in China today is carried out by the state sector, and its economy is controlled by raising or lowering this state sector of the economy. Was, were, were these changes that were carried out by China, were they a deviation from Marx or were they bringing it closer to Marx? The conclusions that I would give in the book is if we look at what Marx himself wrote, not what other people said Marx wrote, what China did brought it closer to the positions of Marx. Marx wrote in the Communist Manifesto, the, the proletariat will use its political power to political supremacy to wrest by degree all capital from the bourgeoisie, to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state, i.e. Of, of the proletariat organized as the ruling class, and to increase the total productive forces as rapidly as possible. Note by degree. Marx therefore envisaged a period during which both state property and non-state property would exist. And there's a fundamental reason for this. What is the origins of the word socialism? It derives from socialized, large scale. But agriculture in general is not socialized, in particular low development of agriculture. It's individual production. The attempts, therefore, to forcibly collectivize agriculture in the Soviet Union, whatever might have been their political or geopolitical reason in 1929, were not close to Marxist economics. Secondly, the uh, development, the largest socialized production in the world is globalized production. And therefore, again, the attempt to create a self-contained economy within the Soviet Union was a mistake. And China, by opening up its economy after 1978, created the conditions in which it could benefit from massive social uh, uh, socialization production. I, I don't have any confusion in this. This doesn't mean that all forms of globalization, and particularly capitalist globalization, etc., are correct. But it corresponds to Marx's ideas of socialization of production as it was carried out by China. So, so therefore, the conclusion that outlined in the book, I can only deal with that very briefly, is that what China did was not a deviation from Marx. It actually brought the Chinese economy closer to the economic structure that was envisaged by Marx in the Communist Manifesto in Capital and into the critique of the Gotha program. Finally, what's the significance of all this for other countries in addition to China? It is my profound belief that the, because precisely it corresponds to Marxist theory, nobody of course can mechanically copy China, they, that China would be first to say this, but other countries can 
learn from this and apply some of the basic rules and ba or basic forms of development. We've already seen this in Vietnam, which is also another spectacular economic success. Laos was another spectacular economic success. These have very, very close to what is actually China's economic model. But I would also pay attention to Bolivia. Bolivia had the most successful economic development during the pink tide in, uh, as it was so-called in Latin America. And Bolivia's was the economic model, which came closest to China's. It wasn't exactly the same as China's, and, but nevertheless, the key things which existed there was that you had the state ownership of the key, key parts of the economy, but in the in case of Bolivia, the nat natural resources, you had a very high level of state investment, and you had a very successful economic policy. It was, was because this economic policy was so successful that in my opinion, when confronted with the anti-democratic coup uh, to get rid of Evo Morales, the Bolivian people fought back and overturned the coup because they knew that they had been living better during that period of time. So therefore, I also know there's discussions taking place in Venezuela, in Brazil and other countries on this. So therefore the final conclusion that would draw in the book is exactly the fact that it is vital for socialists throughout the world to discuss the issues which exist in China and in order to learn from, not to mechanically copy, but to learn from them. So therefore, I have, in a very brief period of time, I hope I've outlined what are some of the key things which in the book, and I hope you also give you a bit of insight into the economic discussion and the political discussion which actually takes place in China. Thank you very much.